Good morning and welcome back. There are a couple of things I want to say to you today. First of all, a shout out to some good friends. We have uh, Charlie and Lori Palumbo who live in Hastings, Michigan, who support us faithfully and watch us every week. We have Kevin and Sandra Jeffries in Brandon, Mississippi, old friends of mine in my former church who love to watch and they support our church as well. Judy Carr. Many of you haven't gotten to know Judy yet. She's local, but she has become a new part of us. And there are many others, so if you watch, maybe next week I'll mention you. So let's prepare our hearts for worship as we sing our gathering song. call to worship is taken from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge.
invoke God's blessing, let us pray. Our Father, you look on us with pity and you've given us, most of us, many days in this earth. Through many toils and troubles, you have kept us every one. And so we worship you now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Our first scripture readings today come from the book of Genesis. We begin with Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of the tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sias of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood nearby under a tree. Where's your wife Sarah? they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. And now we turn to Genesis 21, the first seven verses. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
One of the most significant parts about corporate worship, being together, is we're not in our closet worshiping separately, worshiping by ourselves. That needs to come first before we ever step out into the public to practice our religion. But in public worship, corporate worship, there's a we that's far different than just the I. Part of corporate worship is reading scriptures responsively. We have the two litanies, one in the beginning, one at the end. We have corporate prayer, the Lord's Prayer. We read the scriptures together responsively. Worship is not a spectator sport. We're not on the sidelines watching someone else do it. While I'm watching this video with you on Sundays, I am in the video, the reader of the litanies, but I, I am the people at home. So when, when the responsive comes for the congregation, I'm reading that because I'm, the corporate, I'm part of the corporate worship too. So we want to remember that the four hymns that we're singing, it's not a band singing to us. We are singing with one voice to God as we sing these hymns. So sing those hymns when they come up. We are reading the scriptures, not just someone reading to us. We are doing that together to build our own faith. And we are making an offering together, not just one person, but each person brings whatever he can bring. We don't worship with words only. So let us now prepare our hearts for worship. As we come together, let us pray. Lord, teach us to be unafraid to give, to be generous throughout our lives, to know that you watch for us and that you care, and that you love a cheerful giver, not a grudging, begrudging one who will do it maybe for the sight of others. Lord, keep us from that hypocrisy, but teach us to love the things you love. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Our second scripture readings begin with the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 to 42, and verses 51 to 59. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come here on my own. God sent me. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. We continue with Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said of him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Perhaps the most important question that was ever asked was, what must I do to be saved? The business of the church is to talk about what God has done in Christ to save us. But the question is, how do we receive that? How do we know what true faith is? Scripture gives us some wonderful examples, particularly Abraham, who is called the, called the father of all who have saving faith. So today, my principal point I want to make is that everyone can be reconciled to God by believing the same truths 
that Abraham believed. So what are those truths? The first truth that Abraham believed is he, need, he believed he needed a perfect righteousness that only Christ could give him. If you say, well, Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, that was a complaint brought against Jesus as well when he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham believed he needed a perfect righteousness that only Christ could give him. The obedience of Jesus is the perfect righteous gift from God that saves us. This is extremely important to understand. In order to truly know that you, your salvation is not based on your performance, your obedience to God's law, but it is, you must understand that it is based on the righteous life of Christ who earned eternal life and in his death, he took upon himself the full penalty for sin. Jesus is the beginning and the ending of your righteousness. So to believe on Christ is to believe first that you need a perfect righteousness, which only Christ can give. Jesus stood in your place, and his perfect obedience to the Father is given to all who receive him as the Lord. Scripture said Jesus came to learn obedience and to be perfected or qualified to be the Savior. He had to be a man who kept the law. That was the qualification. Christ suffered even unto death that he might become a suitable Savior for sinners. Hebrews 5, 8 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Reconciliation with God is only through the active obedience of Jesus in his humanity and through his passive obedience of suffering the wrath of God in our place. This is what is meant by the righteousness of Christ by which we are saved. The active and the passive obedience of Jesus to his Father is your righteousness, granted as a gift that you can never earn. Being asked to obey what we really want to do anyway is no test of loyalty and love for anyone. But being asked to obey what, is our, what our spirit recalls from, that is the test of love. Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Hebrews 2.10 says, In bringing many sons to glory, that's us, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect or completely qualified through suffering. The suffering of Jesus is salvific. It saves. It is the work of Christ that has earned the righteousness that he gives to us. That scripture I just read, does not mean that Jesus needed to acquire perfection and that the only way to acquire perfection was to suffer. He was always perfect, always holy, always harmless, always undefiled, always God. But with each instance of suffering, he learned in practice as a man what it means to obey. And by being steadfast in his human nature, in each action of suffering, he became a suitable savior for mankind. Such a high priest meets all our needs, Hebrews says. Abraham believed. He, he needed a perfect righteousness that only Christ Jesus could give him. Again, Jesus said in John 8, 58, Before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham saw Jesus by faith. We see Jesus by faith as well. Do you believe this also? If you are trusting anything other than the perfect obedience of Jesus to save you, you are going to be shocked and surprised when you die. You will have no righteousness. You are not yet saved if you're trusting anything beyond, your, anything beyond Jesus Christ, something that you produce even your faith does not save you. Christ saves you. 
Faith in Christ is the tool. You have not yet given up your own efforts to please God for righteousness unless you are truly turning. Nothing in your hands do you bring, simply to the cross you cling. So Abraham first believed that he needed a righteousness which he couldn't provide for himself, a perfect righteousness in order to be saved. The second truth that Abraham believed is that God would raise him from the dead. Romans 4.17 testifies to the faith of Abraham. Romans 10.9 and 10 says to us, We must believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. For if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We have to believe that God will raise us from the dead because he raised Jesus from the dead. And if we are in Jesus, we cannot die. Because a dead Christ cannot raise us from the dead, you have to believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Jesus came in our flesh to achieve his own resurrection from the dead. And in that power, he will raise us up from the dead also. So you see how vital it is to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead bodily not just in myth and not just in story and not just in spirit, but that dead body that was crucified, God raised from the dead and transformed it into his marvelous body today. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, Equip you with everything good that you may do his will. But what was the first part? The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. We, have, we must believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus in order to be saved. The death of Christ did not merely precede his resurrection. It was the price that obtained it. God brought him from the dead by the blood of the eternal covenant. That's the text I just read to you. Which is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus refers to his death. And the resurrection was the reward and vindication of his obedience unto death. Romans 1 4 says that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. And his resurrection was his reward for his obedience unto death. Abraham believed that God would raise him also from the dead. And in that faith, he was willing to obey God, even to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, if that's what God wanted him to do. Because he believed God could raise the dead. He could raise Isaac to fulfill his promises. Do you believe that God raises the dead? Do you believe that Jesus is alive and well at the right hand of the Father, still in that body that was crucified? Now it has been glorified, but it's still a human body that our Lord, the one that our Lord was in when he died. Or is that too much for you to, to believe, really to believe that God raises the dead? Every time these days now I stand in a cemetery, which is quite often, I look at all those graves and I think one day the trumpet will sound and every last one of them is going to come out of the grave. Some unto life eternal and some unto death eternal, living and yet dead, separated from God. But no one's going to remain there because Christ rose from the dead. He will raise us up too and those who truly trust in him will be raised to eternal life. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 says, Paul writes, We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired, even of life. But this happened, this despair, so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. <clears throat> Paul is saying, I was as good as dead. I knew I was, I was going to be executed. I despaired of life. I had no hope. 
But that happened to him so that he would put his hope in God, who raises the dead. It is central to the mission and the message of Jesus that he will raise us from the dead. These are precious verses in John 6, 37 through 40. And I quote, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but will raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Abraham believed that God will raise him from the dead. You must believe that also. So the second truth Abraham believed is that God would raise him from the dead. The third truth Abraham believed is that God's promises would always come to pass. That's the heart of faith. Without that, there's no faith. God's promises will always come to pass. Abraham had no evidence at the moment God promised to bless all mankind through him. God had told him, I will make of you a great nation. And Abraham had no children. 24 years later, he was 99 years old, he still had no children. His wife was now 90, and Abraham knew that the time of natural birth was long since past, and nobody had heard of a man who is as good as dead and a wife who is barren, bearing children to make a nation. Yet, the scripture says, Abraham believed God. He considered his own body, Romans 4, 2, 20 and 21 said, now as good as dead, and Sarah's body, unable to bear children. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And here's the key phrase, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's necessary. That is faith. Are you fully persuaded that what God has promised, he's able to pull off? Genesis 15, 6, Abraham says Abraham believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. Romans 4, 18 states emphatically that against all evidence, in hope against hope, Abraham believed God performs as he promises. It says Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to perform. Do you believe that? That's the heart of saving faith in God. You believe that what God has promised, he is able to perform. We are called to believe the same promises. Romans 5.19 says, For as by this one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, that's the first Adam who disobeyed, so by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Began by asking how are we reconciled to God? What do we have to believe in order to be reconciled to God? We have to believe we need a perfect righteousness. We have to believe in the resurrection of the dead, first that of Christ and then of our own. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That is the promise that you and I must believe. In order to be declared not guilty and counted as righteous before God, I must have a righteousness which be, of which God approves. God will have to provide it, for I cannot earn it. God must decide that I am perfectly righteous to enter heaven. The righteousness God requires is perfect love for him and for his law without a single violation ever. No man can do that. How can sinners like us acquire that righteousness? It is the righteousness of Jesus credited to those who truly believe on Christ. Philippians 3.9, Paul says, I am striving not to have a righteousness of my own that comes from my own obedience to God, but that righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the gift from God to we who believe 
God raised him from the dead, and that God's promises always come to pass. The obedience of Christ is imputed to those who believe. It is counted as yours, as much yours, as if you had done it yourself. Christ fulfilled all righteousness perfectly. And when I trust in him alone for my salvation, that obedience is counted as mine. By one man's, diso- one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Abraham did not physically see Jesus, <clears throat> but he believed he was coming. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How did Abraham see Jesus? He believed it was true because God said it. We too must rejoice that the Christ came and that he is coming again to receive us to himself. What evidence do I have? The promises of God recorded in scripture. They have recorded for us what God has done. That's what the scriptures are for. It is the historical record of the activity of God in this world to bring about his salvation for sinners through his own son, Jesus Christ. Abraham believed God based on God's promises alone. So in conclusion, everyone can be reconciled to God by believing the same truths Abraham believed. What were they? He believed he needed a perfect righteousness that only Christ could give him. And John 8 says so. Abraham believed, second of all, that God would raise him from the dead. And the scripture tells us he will. And third, Abraham believed God based on God's promises alone. No other evidence. The voice of God in the unbreakable scriptures. He believed God, and so must we. Romans 10, 9 and 10 summarizes all of this this way. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's simple. This is a magnificent promise. Believe it and be sure it is true. As we close now in a time of prayer, take a moment and pray silently and I will Lead us in prayer in just a moment. Pray for our country. Pray that Christians will not be divided. Pray that evil will not be returned for evil. Pray that hatred will give way to love. Take a moment now and pray in silence and then I will lead us. Almighty God, we are an ungrateful people. We live among an ungrateful people. Our hearts have been wrong so many times, and oftentimes, even if we see it, we don't particularly care. We ask you to make us alive in the Holy Spirit. We pray that the fruit of the Spirit would be born in us, love, joy, peace, patience, temperance, goodness, for against these things there is no law. Give us wisdom, give us patience. Give us faithful hearts. Lord, help us not to travel to the beat of the world, but to listen to you and be willing to stand for your gospel and for the glory of Jesus Christ, no matter what. We pray for our president and the cabinet. We pray for our senators and congressmen. Lord, we ask that you have poured out your wisdom. Send among them men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Send those good people to walk among them, to speak the word and the will of God. Have mercy, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The hymn that we just sang, Freely, Freely, is one of my all-time favorites. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I've been born again. In Jesus' name, freely, God has given this to us. Any man hears the gospel and turns his heart of stone away from it, the love of God has given him a great chance. We pray we are not among those people, but God will sensitize us as we sing, as we remember his scriptures, and as we pray together. So now let us close with our responsive litany. litany. I'll read the pastor, and you read the people. And when I'm watching this online, I'll be part of you reading the people. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Receive the benediction. Now may the love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon you all now, now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope to see you next week, God willing.